So we have done the background during the three first sessions, and now we start really to work with uh, conformally invariant objects. So usually to prove conformal invariance, it's very, very hard. But there is one special case which is quite easy, which is the case of Brownian motion. So somehow it's the typical uh, conformally invariant object. Uh, we will need Ito's formula in dimension two. So basically it's exactly the same proof. And we will need to have a function that can depend on x and on t. So it doesn't change anything. What you want is to be c2 for the first variable. Sorry, I changed this. And c1 for the second one. Let's say we will have a c, c infinite, uh, infinitely derivable function, so we don't care. Let's say a very smooth function. And here, so it will be in C. So I will plug something which is a random process in C, which is this x. And this will be the time. And so I will plug a random process as well, which will be a time reparameterization. So it will be a process in, uh, in R. So in, an increasing process in R. So you take whatever increasing process which is adapted, and for your process in, uh, in C, it will be always of this kind. So exactly as yesterday, it's the integral against this time two, Brun two Brownian motions since we are in dimension two. So B1 and B2 are two independent Brownian motions. OK? And so in this case, where you plug this, you can compute the derivative of f at time uh, t. And you, you get exactly this is the usual term that we recognize from yesterday, the term in db. This is a term which is exactly due to the fact that we have in a dependence in t. And that's the most natural term you could imagine, really, that's the normal derivative. And there is this term, which is exactly the term of second order from yesterday. OK? So nothing deep here. It's exactly the same formula as yesterday. But unfortunately, we need to apply with more variables. So it gets a little bit more messy. And there is a 1 half which disappeared. Thanks. OK. So today, what we want to do is to consider a Brownian motion, so in dimension 2, in a simply connected or any domain. U. So we have, let's say we start from zero or from, we start a Brownian motion and we wait until it exits uh, the domain U. So it exits at time tau of U. That's a stopping time. And what we want to do is to consider a conformal map, F conformal. and to look at the image of this process in this new domain. Our goal today is to prove that this process is almost a Brownian motion. It's, in fact, a time reparameterized Brownian motion. So before, you will see the proof is straightforward somehow, really. Uh, there is nothing to do. Uh, there, there, there are things to do, but the strategy is completely straightforward. But before letting you try to do it, I would like just to motivate a little bit why it should be true. And there is, I guess, two standard uh, motivations for that. And I like none of them, but I will do both. So the first one is to look at what is that, f of bt? In the, in the I mean, I look, looking at the increment of this. So somehow I want to write this like the integral of something. And for that, I will use uh, Ito's formula. So in our case, if I take b, 
my process sigma t is not existent, it's constant, so this term will not appear in my formula. And a s1 and a s2, it's just one. I'm just taking the sum. So this term will just be the integral between 0 and t of 0 and 1 of f of bt of bs, say, d b1s, plus the same thing So that's the first term. And when you are holomorphic, this thing, zero one 1 of f of bs, just f of bs, f prime of bs. So this thing here, and zero two 2 of f of bs, it's i times f prime of bs. That's just because I'm analytic. So when I plug here, here, I just find somehow I can rewrite this nicely by saying that that's, that's equal to this. So I have this first term. Can somebody tell me what the second term is equal to? I see that everybody is stuck there. So I mean, this is just I put the first term there here. This is exactly the definition there. Perhaps what is annoying people is this part. Or is everybody? So is someone stuck because of this? I mean, when you are not used with holomorphic function, it's, it will be normal almost. So this is when you take a holomorphic function, the, develop the development around the point is this thing. So I take at, say, 0 plus small o of z. So if I compute f of e h, uh, if, if I compute f of h, so I compute this derivative, I will exactly find that this thing converges to f prime of 0. So that gives me this inequality. If I compute f of e h, then here I will have a, uh, of i h, I will have an i here. So these two equalities are just due to that. That's straightforward equalities. So I can rewrite this like this. The second term now, what is it equal to? What can we recognize here? So the a t are equal to 1. So this disappears. And we, we sum 1 half of what is this thing? The sum of the second derivative, so twice derivative in any direction. So if I rewrite this, I find What is this thing? Sorry? It's a B, right? Yes, it's a B. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a B. What is this thing? I mean, what is the operator? That's the Laplacian. What is the Laplacian of a holomorphic function? Zero. Yes. So all this term vanish. vanishes. So I can forget about this term. And what do I get? I, did, I get that f of bt is the integral between 0 and t of something against the Brownian motion. So for instance, if I take f of bt minus f of bs, I will just find the integral between s and t of f prime of bu um, dbu. And because the Brownian motion has independent increments, you deduce automatically that this has independent increments also. 
So somehow the only thing which is missing will be uh, the, say, um, the law of, of your, your process. Yes? The middle term is zero because there is no sigma t. If you want to, you put sigma t equals zero. So d sigma t will be zero. Yeah? Here I start, so, I mean, this case, it, uh, it contains this one. So I can put f of x t equals f of x, uh, and, uh, and it works. OK, so that's the first motivation. That's not my favorite. I have another one. So let's take a very small t. When I do the expansion around 0, I get f of 0 plus f prime of 0 times b delta t plus terms that are smaller. And of course, in terms that are smaller, I'm cheating a lot when I'm saying that. But let's say that this thing, finally, it looks very much like a Brownian motion, except that this thing is not a standard Brownian motion because I scale it by f prime of 0. So here you start to understand that I need to rescale the time in order to have this to be equal to a real standard Brownian motion. So what I want to do is my delta t, I want it to be equal to f prime of 0 squared delta s. Why? Because in this case, this thing will be f prime of 0 b of f prime of 0 squared delta s. And this is, uh, so it's a minus. This is a standard, this is the increment of a standard Brownian motion. And somehow if I did that at time t, I would have that here I should rescale this thing, I should rescale by f prime of bt to the minus 2. So finally, it's very hand waving here, but yes. Yes. Right. So that's so an particular case. Exactly. So here, I mean, I know so exactly Dubin Schwartz. Yeah. So I can use Dubin Schwartz and I've finished. But the proof of Dubin Schwartz is much harder than what I'm gonna do. Actually it contains exactly the same proof. I mean that's you prove both the same way. So but that's a very good remark. There is a theorem that automatically tells you here that this is a time change Brownian motion because this is a martingale. We saw yesterday that when you integrate against a Brownian motion, you are a continuous martingale, and continuous martingales, they can be, uh, they, they are all time parameterization of Brownian motion. Yes? Uh, okay, so just like to get a question. Is there a time change value motion the Yes, yes, if the time is increasing, yes. I think so. Time chess is random but adapted. So you need it to be adapted if you want to be a Markov processor. You need it to be adapted, otherwise you can have uh, whatever thing. Okay, so a time change value motion is always a Markov processor. If you have, if you have, every, I think. Every continuous Markov is a Markov processor. Uh, Yes. I mean, this is a Markov process, obviously. Okay. In this case, that, that's but all the martingales can be written like this, yes. All the continuous martingales can be uh, integration against a Brownian motion, and all uh, these uh, things are uh, time, uh, param time reparameterization of Brownian motion. I need to ask the French here because they all follow the right course, so I think that's true. I mean. What do you add as? So the drift need to go to infinity, sorry. The drift, need, the drift need to go to infinity. But otherwise, I think that's the only conditions. That's a little bit weird, but I mean, you have these two theorems. 
uh, Dubin Schwartz and the representation uh, theorem that tells you this kind of thing, I, I think. Okay, so somehow this tells you that you want to reparameterize your Brownian motion, and it's what we are going to do. So let's try to do this together. So what I propose to do is to define two times, so this one and its uh, inverse time minus one of t. And what I'm going to do, what we want to prove is that the time parameter the time change of this Brownian motion is exactly a Brownian motion. So, so this is our time change. We want to prove that that's a Brownian motion. And what I will do, and you are going to tell me what it is, I will add an independent Brownian motion at the end of this process. Just, okay. So what did I do here? Very simple thing. I just say I want to prove that something is a Brownian motion, and I don't want to be stuck with, say, a Brownian motion that exits at some random time. So what do I do? I add a new Brownian motion, completely independent, that I attach at the end of this Brownian motion. And that's exactly what I did here. I took a Brownian motion. Here, if you prefer this thing, it's exactly T of this. So just saying, before I reach the time sigma u, I'm only equal to that, because this would be equal to 0. And Yes. And once I start to, um, when this thing starts to get stuck at tau u, then these things start to be non-trivial. That's my Brownian motion. OK? So first question, why is it continuous, this process? I mean, don't be scared by. Uh, the time reparameterization just say that. So what, what do you want to prove? Perhaps I should begin by that. What do you want to prove to prove that that's a, a Brownian motion? That somebody has an idea what you should prove. Correlation. Sorry? Correlation. Correlations. Which, so what do you want exactly to prove? I mean, let's. OK, let's, let's try to have uh, an exact and simple thing to prove. There are a couple different strategies. One, you could show the covariance between W and S is that T is <coughs> independent. You can show continuous process of independent stationary increments. OK, so yeah, I think first, every time you will need really to have something continuous. And second, oh, you can prove that it has in independent increments. So here it will be. So just, I should be more precise here. I want to prove that that's a Brownian motion, but against some, of course, um, sigma algebra. So it will be the sigma algebra generated by B of sigma t and to u for every t less or equal to s. Let's say to the natural one, with respect to the natural one. So you want to prove that that's independent. And the last thing is to prove that that's a normal of parameter t minus s. So that would be definitely the easiest uh, strategy. There is a second one, which is 
So there is only one process like this, and that's Brownian motion. Just there is a second one, which is to prove that uh, WS is a martingale. And WS squared minus S is a martingale. And that's called Levy theorem. And actually, the history of this uh, theorem is uh, connected to Levy, since he's the first one to prove it. And I mean, the proof is almost the same. Proving this theorem or this one, everything is connected. I mean, proving that everything can be represented by time change Brownian motion, it's always the same proof. Yes? Continuous. So WT minus WS must be independent of GS. Yes, uh, sorry. Of GS, yes. Sorry? Yes, that's a G, uh, that's a big G. You don't do the G like this? Sorry? And this is an N. <laughs> Sorry. So. OK. You don't like my writing. No. I mean. <laughs> OK. So you want to prove that. So first, how do you prove that it's continuous? So, sorry? Yeah, um, I mean, this one, you have to check something. I mean, this, that's the inverse of something, but, so that's the inverse of an increasing function, but this, if this increasing function has some steps where it's, uh, where it's uh, just uh, flat, then the inverse won't be continuous. But it cannot be flat because f prime is non-zero we have a conformal map. So if prime is non-zero, so this thing is always increasing. It's strictly increasing, so uh, the inverse is uh, also continuous. OK, so that's just the thing. First use of uh, conformal map. OK, how do you prove the second step? That's the hardest one, of course. I mean, it's always the same case. We already saw that at least once in the class of, uh, of Jean-Francois. Um, you prove that the conditional uh, Laplace transform is equal to what it should be. So you take scalar product, you take lambda in C, and you take the scalar product, and you want to prove that conditionally to, yeah, no, I'm sorry. Now that you know what it is. You want to prove that this thing is exactly equal to the Laplace transform of a normal, uh, normal uh, distribution of parameter t minus s. So you want to prove that that's equal to to e to the 1 half lambda squared of t minus s. That's the only thing to do. If I prove that, I would have proved exactly the two statements, that this is independent of that, and that that's a normal, a normal variable. OK? I mean, that's basic uh, tool of class 1 of probabilities. OK. So what I can rewrite there is that this thing, conditionally to sigma s, must be equal to e to the 1 half lambda squared, or perhaps I should say one more step. 
So conditionally to sigma s, it's equivalent. That's a Markov process. I mean, that's easy. So that's equivalent to proving that this thing conditionally to ws. That's a Markov process. So we have this for free. And I will allow me something which is not very orthodox, but at least, I mean, that's easy. You can even condition on, on omega, on, on ws to be equal to f of z, to some, uh, to some a, sorry, to some constant. So that's a non-trivial uh, conditioning, but in the case of Brownian motion, nothing is hard. And this thing A, I can even replace it by f of z, because my Brownian motion must be inside, uh, my ws must be inside my domain. So finally, what I need to prove is something slightly nicer, which is the following. No, so that's a bad idea. And if I have ws equal to f of z, here I can replace this by f of z, so I will put it here. So that's really what I need to prove. I need to prove that the Laplace transform of WT conditioning on the place of WS is equal to this. And you see, so far we didn't do anything strange. I mean, that's the most straightforward way of trying to prove that. Just, it's very pedestrian somehow. OK. So this thing, I can rewrite it. Wt, I have a value for it, so I just replace. And look at the other thing here. B, B tilde is an indep independent Brownian motion. So when I do the conditioning on this thing, conditioning over about uh, ws on ws, what I get is just that that's independent of variance, the variance of this thing, so t minus this ugly uh, value. So this thing, conditioning to all that, that's just a normal variable with this a variance. So actually, the second term, instead of rewriting it, I can directly uh, change it, replace it by, say, e of 1 half lambda squared t minus this ugly thing. Still knowing ws equal f of z. Okay? I didn't. I just use the fact that B tilde was independent of what is happening before. Okay. And now, this thing, I can just replace this by saying that I start from f of z. No, oh, sorry. So, what I will do, which doesn't change anything, I will set s equals 0. That's the same computation for any s. So, just we want to. Uh, uh, shorten the notation, so conditioning of omega 0 equal to f of z is exactly saying we start from f of z. So what we need to estimate is this expe huge expectation. OK? So let's say like this. OK, how do we do that usually? When you have an expectation with some stopping times and some ugly things, what do you do? 
I mean, except praying. <laughs> or hoping to be at another place than mine at this moment. <laughs> because. So the only thing you can do is to use the fact that to try to find a martingale and to say this expectation is the same at some other time where it's much nicer for me to evaluate this. So the strategy now is to find a martingale inside and to say, OK, this is at some stopping time. So the expectation is exactly the same as, say, the time 0, and I won. OK, so what, will, what do we like to replace here? We would like to replace this thing, because this is really ugly, by something much nicer. And if you replace this by s on both sides, what you see is that this is the expectation at some stopping time, this stopping time. And when I evaluate this at s equals 0, what I get is e to the lambda f of z, because b starts from z, from uh, f of z, sorry. No, so from z. This is a z. So it will be f of z. And here it will be t minus this thing at time 0, but this thing since sigma of 0 is 0, this will be just t. So if I manage to prove that this thing is a martingale when I replace that by s, I will just have by the stopping time theorem what I will get is that this thing is equal to e to the lambda f of z plus 1 half of lambda squared t. But when, when s equals 0, it's exactly what I want. Yes, it's exactly what I want. Yeah. OK? So the only thing to prove, and all the proof of conformal invariance of Brownian motion uses th use this argument, is to find a martingale. And how do you prove that that's a martingale? Now you got an idea yesterday, you use it a formula, and you prove that the drift equals 0. Because we know that when you integrate against a Brownian motion, that's a continuous martingale. OK. So let's do it, or let's not do it, I don't know. No, let's do it. We are closed now, so. Um, so the martingale m of s, it's exponential of lambda f of bs plus uh, 1 half lambda squared of uh, t minus s. And I must t minus uh, real letter of s. Nice. And this is exactly of the form that I uh, presented here. That's a function of bs and uh, of sigma uh, zeta s. Say. OK. So this thing, I don't even need to compute it. I mean, I know that that's a martingale. So the only two terms I need to compute is this one and this one. So I need the derivative by a, with respect to t of this f. So perhaps I should write what is f. is fixed here. So, so it's an S. So that's a function. So you compute the derivative by, with respect to S, and it gives you a very simple thing. It would be 1 half of lambda squared. And you will have against f of x s. OK. 
The second thing you need to compute Sorry? Is there a minus? Is there a minus? Yes, 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 yes. It would be better for me next time. Thank you. You need to compute uh, the double derivatives of f with respect to uh, so the first variable and the second variable. And I will, I, I will just write the Laplacian because we will need only the Laplacian. But and this is. f prime of x t squared f of x. Uh, what did I do? So that's, OK, that's very, very bad. Sorry. So here we will put a big f. Because here there is an f of x that I forgot. So you see, like, it's, it's very nice proof. We enjoy it a lot. OK, that's, this is uh, what we want to prove. Uh, and this is just a computation. Just do it. It's, I mean, you can give it to your chi uh, child if you want. Or I don't know. To anybody you don't like. <laughs> and anyway, now I just, so this is the two first thing I need to compute, and I need to check this. What, what do I mean by this? So, the d, d of zeta s with the definition of zeta that disappeared, it was exactly f prime of. Uh, okay, so now, sorry, I need just to, comp to do the computation. So, d of f of bs sigma a, uh, zeta s. So there is this Brownian ter this Martingale term. Then there is this second term, which is one minus one half of lambda squared. And here I, ha I have f of b s sigma s. And so I really want a sigma. I don't know why. And I need the derivative of this process. And I erase it, but the derivative of this process, we chose it that way, is f prime of bs squared ds. Because this was uh, what it should be. Yes, 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 yes. So, so you see, I don't know how I went through all these uh, this math exams. Because my computation <laughs> abilities are not really. <laughs> so anyway, now that's harder on the blackboard, we will say. Uh, the second part here, the AT, it's 1 because I only take BS, which is a standard Brownian motion. So I'm again computing only the Laplacian. And so the Laplacian will be exactly lambda squared. So there is this 1 half lambda squared. And now F prime at B BS times f of bs zeta s. And this thing vanishes. This thing is exactly the opposite of this thing. OK? So nothing deep in this theorem. I mean, the motivation, uh, you see it on the motivation that if you rescale it, it would be nice for you. And after, you just do the computation and it works. So I don't know why we chose to do this computation except to show you that you can prove something conformally invariant, and that will be hopefully, no, I mean, not hopefully, but unfortunately, the only process that you, <laughs> you will prove that it's conformally invariant. Because all the, the, the other processes are very, very hard. I mean, that's always a very hard proof to prove conformal invariance of a process. OK, so that was conformal invariance of this process, but so far, we didn't understand why it's useful in any way. So let's just compute something. Perhaps you did already that. Perhaps you never did. But I think that's a nice result. 
I take the unit disk, I start at zero, and I, I add a slit like this. Now I take a Brownian motion starting just here at epsilon. What is the probability that it exists, it exits this domain through this part of the domain? So not touching this. that somebody has an idea about that, or how to do that. Did you understand the question? I'm starting just a little bit on the right, and I'm looking at the probability to exit without touching uh, this slit. Yes? To what? To the disk. Yes, that could be a good strategy. So I just want to avoid finding conformal maps because you saw two days ago that it was hard. But I mean, yes, if you have an explicit map, you can do that. But I would just do something a little bit more, a little bit simpler because some, somehow you see you, you have the brutal force which consists in finding the conformal map and to use really the straightforward property of Brownian motion, which is here the fact that it hits uh, on the circle uniformly. And there is the other strategy, which is trying to do this completely probabilistically. And after there is my strategy, which is trying to take a little bit of both to simplify the problem. So let's try to use a little bit of conformal invariance and still a little bit of probabilities, you will need an estimate, but I guess everybody knows it, so. What do you know? Do you know domains where you know the probability? Yes. Yes. Oh, so you say you, you map to this domain. Why not? We could do that. And after, do you know how to conclude? You remove the slits. So to the OK, so you can do directly map to the upper half plane. Yes. But that would be the same problem. This, th that's exactly the same as if I need to choose between both, I will choose the first one. Because here, I mean, this thing will be map to this and then to something here. So uh, you will have estimate for that, but after you have to estimate how you touch it. And I mean, that's not uniform anymore. So that's even, I mean, that's not complicated question, but let's try to have the simplest argument. But it will work, yes. Yes. Yes, same, same, you will have, it won't be easier, but I mean, Still, yes? Yes, I think that's the easiest one. So if you take the square root, what you get is that you map it to this domain. And here you start from square root of epsilon. But now this, you know how to estimate it. Because, I mean, that's a Gambler rune. This is of the same order as this probability. I mean, same order. I'm not writing completely. I, would, I mean, your proof would give an explicit formula. But let's say we just want an estimate. So this is of the same order, these two probabilities. But now this one, you know that the real part of your Brownian motion is a martingale. So you can apply this to prove that this probability, here it's one, say. This probability is exactly square root of epsilon. That's because your real part is Brownian motion. OK? So this probability is square root of epsilon. You see that if you start from here, it's a little bit less. It's epsilon. I mean, if you start at epsilon from the boundary here, you will get epsilon. Can somebody find uh, another domain that will go from you will have the circle, and you remove something which touch zero, which has 
where when you start at epsilon from this, you will exit it more easily. I mean, I don't know, perhaps you could try to do something like this in a smart way with it touch zero and you exit more easily. So does somebody has an idea about that or no theorem or anything? Not Kerber one quarter, unfortunately, but that's the best one, yes. And you can do this by experimental length uh, series. That's not straightforward, but there is a theorem which tells you some, which tells you the following. That's called burning estimate. And I will not state it exactly. I mean, carefully, but it's really saying the following thing: if you start start at epsilon and you take whatever shape which goes from the boundary to zero, the probability to exit for the Brownian motion will be less or equal to square root of epsilon times some universal constant, which is exactly given by this one. And this is very useful in probability. I mean, perhaps our Brownian motion is not very spectacular, but I mean, if you translate this in terms of random walks, then I mean, at least to me, it's less obvious. So the equivalent for random walks is you take, say, the square lattice, and you take the box of size n, and a path or whatever shape that goes until 0. If you start from here for a, for a random walk, your probability to exit won't be greater than 1 over n. You will be killed very often. And that's very useful for many things. And I guess the first time you had this discrete uh, estimate was in the study of uh, external DLA. But perhaps I'm wrong. I don't know. But I think Keston proved this theorem first. I mean, that's a little bit technical. Too. You, you cannot do it a in a straightforward way. But it was very useful for external DLA. And that's one of the only results that we know about external DLA is due to this estimate. So that's very useful. Uh, estimates. OK. So that was the first piece of cake. And there will be another one at the end, but between it, I need to give you a fundamental example of a conformally invariant object, which is, I mean, basically board in motion. But can somebody explain to me how, if you take, let's say, a smooth domain, and two point A and B, how to define the Brownian motion? I will define you between A and B. I mean a sketch. I, mean, I don't want a full proof, but let's give me how you would you would define it. A Brownian motion from A to B, condition not to exit the domain. So what is the problem a priori? That if you start from A, you will automatically leave the domain in time zero. I mean, in infinite amount of time. So you need to work a little bit, but I mean, how do you do this usually? So you can map it to the half plane. We will see just a little bit, a little bit later that it's much easier to define the equivalent, the equivalent in the half plane. But I want a definition in any domain. I mean, I will, do, I will not do the complete proof, but at least give you an idea. What you do is just you start from a little bit here, a little bit away, and you condition of hitting this small part before exiting. And I mean, Brownian motion is nice. And if you are in a nice domain, this will converge when you let these points go here and these points go here. This, this radius shrink. OK? But now, let's say I take another domain, which is a map by some conformal map f of this domain. So this, this law, I will, this process, I will call it p of so let's say that's u, p of u, a, b. 
Brownian motion excursion, somewhere, sometimes we call it, between A and B. In this, new pro in this new domain, I have two possibilities, two natural processes that are defined on this domain. The first one is just a map F of this Brownian excursion in the domain UAB. But there is another one, which is the excursion that I can directly construct here in this domain between F of U, F of A, and F of B. Conformal invariance of the Brownian motion gives you almost for free, and I mean, when you see that that's the limit here, gives you almost for free that these two things are the same. Sorry. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly the technicality you will have to address. Yes. Why? So if you want a hint, if you start here, basically when you map not this measure but one of the measure you start from to construct this measure, you will start from one point here, which is close from this point, but not, you don't know exactly where, and you will arrive here to something which is close to be at distance epsilon, if you start it at distance epsilon, but it won't be exactly this. It will be more like this. So you need to prove that you have uniformity in the radius and the shape of the thing. But I mean, I guess you will trust me that it works perfectly. So that's really the baby example of conformal invariance. These two measures are the same. When you map them, you, uh, you have the same measure. OK. So there is one, one case where it's even more it's even easier to define the, domain, the, the, the process. So I have 20 minutes left. I won't use them all, I guess, but that's important to talk about that, because otherwise, one part of the, pro the, the OK, so there is one easier case, which is the upper half plane. It's always nice to work in the upper half plane. So how would you define the process in this case? So you want, sorry, uh, so from zero to infinity, of course. Yes? Yes, we could take the, the half circle. So you, you will make it start here at i epsilon and exit a very big circle. Why not? There is even better than this. I mean, we have, look, look at what we did here. We were exactly in the same shape. Somehow, if you, tell, if you give me a circle, exactly like here, I will not be able to compute explicitly what is the probability of exiting. So perhaps it's easier to take this case somehow. So that was a good idea, but it would be even better if you would say, OK, we condition to go above R before exiting the domain. Because what is the probability of that when I take the conditional So I will call this, say, P of epsilon r. P of epsilon r will be the probability of a Brownian motion conditioned on the fact that it touches so, uh, i r plus r before exiting. But what is nice in this case is that this thing, I can replace it by and here and divide by the probability of this event that I know, which is epsilon over r. So in other words, I can look at this. So somehow here, what is nice is that you don't have conditioning anymore. You just have the multiplication by some value. And so you can check that when you take epsilon and r to infinity and 0, what you obtain is some measure that I will call, again, measure from 0 to the Brownian excursion from 0 to infinity. OK? So that's a construction which is a little bit, I mean, you feel that it will be a little bit easier to handle this case. 
And somehow, it's exactly the same. I mean, this is a ball around uh, infinity, somehow. OK. And so the last question I want to ask to you tonight is the following. OK. I give you 0, and I give you what we call a hell. So that's an ugly name for a compact set on the boundary, which, which is nice like this. Question, what is the probability for this Brownian excursion to avoid A? We have uh, there, so I don't know. <laughs> Can somebody say? So do we have a hope of computing it? I mean, I hope, but perhaps you don't. I don't know. Let's think of what we did before for the burning estimate. How did we do to compute the probability of exiting? I mean, no, no, forget what I did. It's, it's very, very bad. So in order to estimate this, I mean, it's, it's defined, but we don't know exactly what it does. So the easiest thing would be to look at this and to look at the probability here. The probability when epsilon and r goes to 0 and infinity. So if I want to estimate that the Brunian motion does not is this, I can say that that's the limit when epsilon goes to 0 and r goes to infinity of this probability. So we get r over epsilon of this thing. It's probability that it exists r before hitting this ugly set. This is exactly the equivalent. By construction of my measure, it's exactly what I need to prove to try to estimate this. I mean, I, I don't need to prove that. This is a, f a formula. Now I need to estimate this. So how can I do to estimate this? How did I do before? I was starting at epsilon from the boundary, and uh, I use a conformal map to map it to a nice domain and to estimate what is happening in this domain. Can I do the same kind of thing here? Obviously, I can't. <laughs> So in which domain do you want to map this in order to have something nice? Sorry? To H. Yes, exactly to H. So you want to map this to H. But I mean, there is several ways of doing that. We saw that we have three degrees of freedom. So let's try to choose them smartly. So what can I do? What would be the good choice? So let's just think about what we can do. We can fix three points on the boundary. We can fix one point inside. And uh, one point on the boundary, we can fix, say, two points on the boundary and the derivative at some point. We can do a lot of things. So let's just, I mean, we can do a lot of things, but a finite number of things, obviously. So uh, just try to, in your head, to, to see what would be the best thing. I mean, your point is starting at epsilon, so close to 0. So I mean, if you want an estimate, which is kind of, yes? So you send 0 to 0, that's a very good idea. So 0 would be sent to 0. So I will call this map phi, phi A. 
So phi a of 0 equals 0. So what do we want to do? Yeah, so that's, uh, we, we say that we were mapping this set, this, this domain, to this one. So when I'm saying that I'm mapping this domain to this one, it's really the complementary of all of that. So that's, I mean, A disappears completely. We don't have it anymore. But we have still two other choices, yes? No, no, that was just a stretch. <laughs> yeah? So you could, I mean, do you think that A will play any uh, role in this domain? I mean, we are not evaluating the probability to hit A. We are evaluating the probability to avoid it. So, I mean, A, we made it disappear just by mapping it to H. But I mean, that was a, a good try. So what, what, yes, sorry? Yeah, look, I mean, here we are going to, so basically, our Brownian motion will start from here. And the only thing which is remaining is to evaluate the probability that it exits phi of r. Phi of r, sorry. So r plus i r. That's exactly what we want to evaluate. Saying the probability that this thing in this domain exits here before exiting the domain by conformal invariance, it's exactly saying a Brownian motion starting from here will exit five, uh, phi of r plus i r before exiting the, uh, the upper half plane. So what we want now is to have a nice thing for this. So the first thing is to map infinity to infinity, because if it starts to be something close, we won't estimate anything. So let's map infinity to infinity. So infinity in this case, uh, you should really think about uh, the Riemann sphere. It's a point on the boundary of your domain. So we still have one degree of freedom. Yes, yes. We want actually this. So this contains this. This costs two degrees of freedom, sending infinity to infinity and fixing the derivative at infinity. OK? So we can choose a map like this. But now this set, what does it look like when it's sent by this map? I mean, it looks, yes, when r goes to infinity, it looks a little bit like r. I mean, it will be more and more like r plus i r. So now the probability to exit here, and when epsilon goes to 0, this will look like phi prime of zero of i epsilon because I will be closer and closer to zero. So this thing here, by conformal invariance, that's the probability to start from here and exit here, it will be the same, as, the, the same limit as phi prime of zero i epsilon, so the imaginary part of this, of course, over the distance to r, so which will be r. That's, I mean, exactly the same estimate. We use the fact that here, I don't know, it will be between r minus epsilon and r plus epsilon, but very close to r, equivalent to r. And this is here, the important is the height. You don't care about the place. OK, so finally, the limit we are looking at will be the epsilon disappears, the r disappears, and we are looking at the imaginary part, so there is no limit anymore, sorry, phi prime i of 0 times i. So what is exactly this thing? Because I don't like the imaginary part. What is it equal to? I mean, just try to remove let's say, five things, five letters. This is two letters. <laughs> okay. 
Because, I mean, is it something nice? Or we are taking the imaginary part. So perhaps this phi prime of A is not very nice when you take its imaginary part. I, I, I don't understand why it's imaginary. Because, so what I didn't do late, uh, earlier, that was perhaps a pity, but here what is important is the height here and the height here. Oh, OK. No, no. Yes, yes. We don't care about the real part. So uh, there are discussion here. Real. Yes, that's real. Phi prime of A of 0, it's a real number. And that's even a positive number. Why? Because, I mean, I didn't have time to discuss this, but when you map a nice dom any domain to a nice domain, it's it pro you can prolong it to the boundary. And when it's flat like this, it's even better because you have a development uh, on the boundary. So, I mean, here you should forget about the boundary and say this phi prime of A of 0, can I evaluate it? Yes, because here it maps R to R. But if it maps R to R, it's that it's, it's real. I mean, if it was not real, it would map R to something which is not R. So because this slit around 0 is sent to the same slit here, then you get that this thing is, this is real, so you can remove it, and you get this very nice formula. The, imagine, the probability for this Brownian excursion to exit this, to exit to go to infinity without touching this closed set A is phi prime A of 0. And that's the first example of a very large class of model you will hear about in the last class, which is a restriction measure, where there is almost nothing that changed except that here you get an exponent alpha. That's the generalization. So that's this Brownian motion excursion is really the fundamental tool in restriction measure. And I will just finish two seconds, just tell you about something I find is very, very, very nice. And of course, when you find something very, very nice, you don't know how to explain it. But just I told you that it's very, very, very hard to get a conformal map between two domains. You cannot explicitly uh, derive it, usually. And there is even worse than this, is that the proof of the Riemann uh, mapping theorem, it's, it's very, very far from being constructive. You optimize something, and you don't see what you, uh, you do, and, uh, and so on. So what I will show you here is that actually there is a very nice probabilistic way of seeing what is the real part of it or at least what is the real part when you send it to the right domain. So you take an ugly domain, very, very bad domain, bad. And you send it, what I will look at is the conformal map that sent to, to the slit, uh, to the, sorry, to the band of, of width uh, one. And so I need to fix points on the boundary. I need to fix my three degrees of freedom. So I would first uh, put two. OK, so perhaps I was a little bit optimistic on my drawing capacity. So I will do something a little bit nicer, because otherwise it's not going to work. So let's say something like this. So you take A and B. And what we will do is we, we will send A to minus infinity, say, and b to plus infinity. OK. I want to construct this conformal map. To have something, I mean, that I could compute, for instance. Or I could give to uh, somebody who has a big computer a method to estimate it. Because so far, we have nothing with uh, the old proof. I know that there is a conformal map phi, which sends this to this. There is actually, actually a lot of them, because you have translation invariance with respect to uh, this. So actually, any map 
where you add an a purely imaginary constant uh, will, will make the deal. The thing is, if you start a Brownian motion somewhere here, and you say, OK, I look where it exits the domain. If it exits here, I give 1. And if it exits here, I give zero, 0. So in other words, I compute this. where f is equal to 1 here and 0 here. So f is defined by these boundary conditions. Can you give me what is this in terms of phi? That's its real part. F x z is, is sent to some f of z here, and so this thing here, the probability to go, uh, so phi of z, sorry. The probability to hit here before here is exactly phi of z. So this thing is the real part of phi of z. But you see, see this is something you can really compute. I mean, you, you give it to a computer, and you say, OK, I will take a very me fine mesh size, and you give me, you send random walks, and you, you estimate by Monte Carlo, or I don't know. Very easily, you can compute this real part. And when you have this thing, you have the real part of your function. And it's well known that when you have the real part, you can use cauchy riemann equations to get the imaginary part. And of course, you have a constant that will, you will not be able to fix in the imaginary part. But that's exactly the constant that we didn't think at the beginning. So of course, it would be nicer to have even a proof of I mean, here we use already that phi is existing. I mean, can somebody, so that's an open question, I guess. I mean, here you have, so, so if I, oh, that's, if I draw here the diagram, I would like to say the following. I would like to say, I forget about this. I take this map, I take its complex conjugate, harmonic conjugate, and I would like to say that's the conformal map from here, from here to here without knowing that there exists some. To reprove, say, this uh, Riemann mapping theorem without using anything. So the difficulty here would be to be able to prove that. So if I map the thing here, it would be a, a nice thing like this. So this is um, the level lines of my function here. And somehow I need to prove that they don't intersect and that they behave nicely so that the orthogonal here lines are really defining a nice conformal map. Because when I start from this and I take its imaginary, uh, its complex con holomorphic conjugate, I have no reason why it should be a conformal map. So if somebody has a good idea to write, I mean, this very nicely, that would be much nicer proof. I guess it's only technicalities, but I mean, a nice proof like this would be a constructive proof of uh, the Riemann mapping theorem. Thank you. <laughs> so, do you have any question? Yes. Yes. So after you can, exp you can have estimate of phi prime of A at 0, and you will be able to relate it to the size of A, yes. Not, no, I mean, that's the nicest one. Uh, I mean, that's the nicest formula, exact formula. It does not depend only to the distance of A to, uh, to 0. It's much more precise. And uh, you have many sets that are some prescribed distance, and that will have a very different harmonic measure of things like this. Sorry? I mean, you want a distance A. I would say the circle of radius A, but I will cheat. <laughs> no, no, no. So I mean, you don't have, because you just have to take <laughs> almost the whole uh, semicircle, and, and you will still be able to exit 
going through the small hole, but not more than this. So there is no optimi optimization here. Okay, thank you.